I'm happy to introduce John Kabat-Zinn, who's streaming in for us in a moment. Um, one of the things that I've, John's, I never heard John say this, but one of the things I kind of got from John is this sense that no moment is more important than any other moment. It's just like we can be, there's not like, oh, we're looking forward to this some other moment that's happening. Even though I've been looking forward to this moment for a while, <laughs> to the extent we can actually um, be present for ourselves. And John is just such a beautiful teacher and friend and mentor of somebody who's kind of paved the way of bringing uh, both the science and the mindfulness together, uh, not only for people in the U.S., but really globally. And when the pandemic started, John and I had the great honor of hosting um, uh, daily, uh, every weekday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, John Bashu, too, as well. Uh, we got to uh, hold meditations and, and teachings for just kind of everyone around the globe. And I was amazed at how many people had been touched by John but had never seen him or met him. And so the virtual world had actually given us this opportunity to connect with um, thousands and thousands of people across the world. Uh, and so... Uh, that was just a beautiful thing. I actually had asked John to do an evening talk. I said, the pandemic started, would you give one talk one evening? He's like, sure, I'll do one talk one evening. And then he calls me the next day. He's like, you think we could do it daily? I was like, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and then we committed for a week, I think, after that. So it was one night, then we committed for a week, then we committed for a month, and then it ended up being three months. But um, he's a dear friend and a beloved uh, teacher. And so please welcome uh, John. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So I've well, asked John. I see, now I can see some of you. <laughs> I've so, asked John to lead us in a meditation, a talk, and maybe a few questions and answers if we have time for that. But how are you doing today, John? How's your heart? I'm, I'm doing just fine. Um, but I have to modulate that response, as I'm sure all of us have had to do for the past two years at least. Uh, I'm doing fine under the circumstances. Right because the circumstances have never been more challenging and uh, for more people than, um, than in these past two years. And, mm -hmm. and, so, uh, and that's true globally. And of course, we know what's going on in the world in, in ways that make it very privileged whether uh, we're here um, you know, virtually or whether we're here in person in, in this room in, in San Francisco that it was an incredible uh, privilege to be able to take this kind of moment and not be under bombs and artillery and rockets and, um, and reconnect with people that perhaps we haven't been out and about for two years given COVID and so forth. So under those circumstances, I'm doing just fine. As you know, I mean, we were together yeah. earlier in the week. So I just got back to the East Coast uh, I was originally going to be here with you in person. Um, and while that is, um, you know, really always wonderful to be in person, I think what we're going to be doing today and what you're going to be doing, engaged in for the entire conference, so transcends uh, the conventional notion of being present in person that we're really all together uh, in the deepest of ways, whether we're in the room or not, because the room is virtually the size of the planet. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I'm going to pass it over to you, John, and you have, the, you have the floor. And when you're ready, we can have a few questions if there's time. Yeah, no, I'd love to have so there be some really interactive dialogue. Yeah. So big hug, Soren, Thanks. and uh, <laughs> deep bow for pulling this off in the face of everything. <laughs> So hi, everybody. And if, if John, if I could actually see, have a camera, yeah, where I can see people. Now I can at least see some of you. So let's take a moment. And if you have stuff on your lap, uh, why don't you put it on the floor? And how nice that you're all together in a room. I had this experience, as I said, uh, early in the week when I was leading a retreat at 1440 with, uh, with my son, Will. And uh, for the first time in two years out in a group. And, and so I'm very well aware that many of you, you know, may not have been so close to people that, uh, that you don't know. I mean, that aren't part of your, you know, sort of tight circle uh, for two years. So let's take a moment to actually 
drop in on ourselves. And often we can um, fine tune that experience by establishing yourself in a sitting posture that in some sense embodies wakefulness and dignity and certainly reminds you of why you signed up for this in the first place, whether you're here in this room in San Francisco or whether you're in your own space anywhere in the world. So just um, seeing if you can sit in a posture that embodies everything that is bringing you here, the deep motivation to connect with others, to connect with yourself. And as Soren was uh, pointing out, I mean, there really is no other time in which to uh, recognize the opportunity for connection because we're only alive in, in this moment. And if we miss this one, then it, the, it doesn't bode well for the next one because we get into the habit of zoning along on autopilot and taking lots of stuff for granted including just the miracle of your own body sitting here breathing now. And so just dropping into silence inside and in between and underneath my words. And just putting out the welcome mat for the entire universe of sensations in the body as it's as you're sitting here. Contact of the legs with the uh, seat of the chair and perhaps with the back of the chair if, if you're leaning back. But I encourage you not to lean back on, on those chairs, but to, in some, some sense be more self-supporting so that the spine elevates out of the pelvis and the head is carried on the neck and shoulders in such a way that it, it really is, is to some degree autonomous. And experiencing grounding yourself in the actuality of the sensations associated with uh, what we call breathing where we're actually drinking in the air around the body and releasing it and thereby sustaining our lives moment by moment. And we're not actually doing it. We do it in our sleep. So when we say I'm breathing, there's a little bit of a problem with that statement because we don't know who the I is that's claiming to be breathing when it's obvious that if it were up to you to be breathing, given how, among other things, you're, how distracted you are, you would have died a long time ago because our capacity for attending is so unreliable and so underdeveloped. So in this moment, actually in awareness, even marveling delighting in the fact that we are being breathed, so to speak. And we have this moment, wherever we are on the planet, in which to be fully at home in our body. And thus fully at home and fully awake, if you will, in the world, in the midst of all the sorrow, anguish, violence, hatred, terminal delusion and confusion amplified by social media and uh, insane levels of political uh, machinations 
cynical machinations. And we're bathing in that as much as we're bathing in the air in the room we're in. And awareness can hold it all with equanimity in this moment. So the gesture of uh, mindfulness, of meditative awareness, is really not passive by any stretch of the imagination. Although from the outside, it looks like there's uh, nothing much happening. Maybe you can feel that just in following my words and the silence underneath them into your own heart that uh, It's a little bit like tuning an instrument. So that when it's time to play, it plays with a certain kind of fidelity. In this case, to your true nature, what you most love, what you most care for, and what you know in the deepest of ways in your heart that go far beyond mere conceptual and cognitive knowing. And this is in some sense, uh, accessing a, a, a true superpower that all of us humans already have, don't need to acquire, but the access often gets overgrown with thorns and brambles. And I'm talking about awareness, pure awareness. And so when we drop in like this to the domain of being, whether you call it meditation or mindfulness or just sitting or, you know, any of the languaging that's used to invite and describe meditative awareness, what we're really doing is reclaiming this uh, superpower birthright of ours. And I'm, I'm using the word superpower by, you know, inspired by Greta Thornburg, who uses that term to describe her own challenges with uh, the autism spectrum. and how evidently she makes use of what many people would consider a deficit to actually transcend all limitations with a clarity and ferocity that is truly selfless and right on target. And she would be the first to say she's no different from any of us in any fundamental way. So maybe by breathing in, we can actually inspire on the in-breath, the inspiration before the expiration, inspire ourselves to tap into what's deepest and best and most beautiful and most creative and most imaginative and most embodied in ourselves. And I'm guessing that your motivation to show up either, uh, either um, digitally or in the room itself at this Wisdom 2.0 conference is a kind of um, signature of a certain kind of love that you have or an intuition of a love that might be possible and embodied and enacted when we can in fact take up residency in our own awareness as a kind of default mode of the flourishing of our humanness in the only moment we ever have, which is called this one. 
but a lot of words. But the invitation here is to drop in to where the words are pointing in your own heart, in your own bones, in your own flesh. And become intimate and at home with stillness and silence. with what I often call the domain of being. Because when we can learn to take up residency in the domain of being and in uh, our, the nature of our being as capable of inhabiting awareness in this way, then the kind of doing that comes out of these moments of being is an entirely different kind of doing. And it's just what the world in its suffering, in its delusion, in its greed, in, it, in its hatred is starving for, absolutely starving for, no even dying for. And we're witnessing it. writ large and horrific in Ukraine, but also in so many other domains in our own worlds and in our own countries and in our own hearts even. Because we too, when you come right down to it, unless we train the mind in some way to become more transparent to these forces are also subject to uh, self-centeredness to believing uh, that we are special and othering others that don't look or talk or have the same values that we might have, which is itself a, a form of uh, violence, aggression. And when we learn to let our doing come out of this domain of open-hearted Heartfulness, mindfulness, awareness, it's an entirely different doing when it comes out of being in this way. And it's exactly what the world is starving for in this moment. So thing now in awareness, anchored in the envelope of the skin and the body sitting here or standing or lying down or whatever posture you happen to be in. And befriending wakefulness, stillness, silence. And the heart's intrinsic spaciousness we sometimes call compassion. A kind of impulse to connect with others that, especially who are suffering in a particular moment, which is where any kindness that actually ever emerges in our lives is coming from. If you become aware of those impulses, they're everywhere. So there's no improving on the human heart. You are not a self-centered and selfish person. But if you believe certain narratives that move through your mind, of course, then uh, you may actually fall into those kinds of ruts, habits that are really habits of synambulance and unconsciousness and semi-automatic kind of uh, zoning along on autopilot. Reacting to stressful conditions rather than responding mindfully, reacting mindlessly, and often generating unwitting or witting harm in the process to yourself as 
well as Anu. So in the remaining moments of uh, this uh, extended guided meditation, just begin bathing in the silence that's underneath my words and your thoughts. that transcends the room that we're in, which is of course, as big as the planet Earth. And noticing how easily we can get caught up in thoughts, in the thought stream. And when you notice that your mind is no longer in your body or with your breathing or just resting in the boundless spaciousness of awareness itself. That noticing is also part of the awareness function. So you're already back and you don't have to blame yourself or criticize yourself or push anything away or pursue anything. It's all at your disposal right in this moment without becoming imprisoned by our own emotional reactivity and endless thought streams and attachment to um, those naughty personal pronouns, I, me, and my, or us and them for that matter. And awareness can liberate us from that just like when a finger touches a soap bubble it self-liberates, it just goes poof. That's how the vulnerable, our attachment to our thoughts and emotions really is. It's like we virtually empty of any essential validity when we tap into the wisdom of your own awareness that, as I've been saying, you don't have to acquire because you were born with this one. The access to it that we need to cultivate and that's why meditation is a way of being, it's a practice. Every moment has its own validity. Can we let it become our default mode, so to speak, the default to mind, fullness and compassion and kindness, especially when the proverbial stuff is hitting the proverbial fan in the world and in our lives. And then let our doing, as I said, come out of this view. Moment by moment by moment. Now, when you're ready, uh, I would invite you to, uh, if your eyes have been closed, as I see many of your eyes have been closed, but you don't need to meditate formally with your eyes closed. But when you care to mindfully becoming aware of your eyes opening and drinking in whatever is in front of you and feeling even whatever's behind you and on either side of you without even turning your head or moving your eyes and sensing that while you're whole sitting here in your chair, you're also part of a much larger wholeness because you've all shown up in either that room or the bigger room of the digital universe. 
and we're all here together. And every single one of us counts. And I'm not ringing any bells. And you'll notice I didn't ring any bells and say, okay, this is the beginning of the meditation practice. And okay, this is the end of the meditation practice because there's no beginning and there's no end to real meditation practice. It's your life. If we're not awake in our lives, then we're zoning through on autopilot, half asleep, half awake, lost in thought, embroiled with reactions, emotional reactions of one kind or another. And um, underscore the loss part. And if the world really does need all its flowers and every single one of us is a flourishing and a flowering of uh, an insanely, uh, an insane beauty that's intrinsic to each one of us so that every flower is somewhat different, but the world needs all of us, then it's important to ask. And I'm kind of guessing that maybe that's what brought you to wisdom 2.0 in large measure is like, to meet other flowers and also to let them reflect back to you what kind of flower you really are. What, and how you can uniquely contribute and also collaborate with all of the rest of humanity in doing the one thing that may be yours to do that no one else on the planet will quite configure in the way you could contribute and I think that's our karmic assignment as, hum as a species at the moment. Because if you were to diagnose what's going on on planet Earth, you take a stethoscope to it that actually measures either global warming or what's going on with the polar uh, ice caps or what's going on with the glaciers and the water supply for you know a third of uh, the world's population, or the uh, obscenity of what one country can do to a neighboring country where they're basically brothers and sisters and even speak pretty much the same language and then to cause the rest of the world to actually uh, be in a condition of moral hazard and compromise because we see it on our screens moment by moment, death and destruction are unimaginable uh, levels for no reason except fantasies in the minds of a few people, narratives about uh, Russia's grievances or empire or a lost opportunity or whatever it is. And, and, and this is kind of disease that medicine knows a lot about. We've pra been practicing what some people call mind-body medicine for 40, 50 years and cultivating, as Soren was saying, you know, especially around mindfulness, huge and very rapidly, in fact, exponentially growing body of scientific evidence that this is actually transforms every aspect of us, including our genome and its expression and our brain and potentially our, even our cellular longevity by practicing what looks a whole lot if somebody was watching you in the room there, a whole lot like nothing. People come in and say, wow, it's like, I don't know how many people are in your room there, but they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. And it turns out that non-doing is very different from doing nothing. And it is actually transformative on every level of our humanity. And we've hardly scratched the surface of what that even means. But at this particular moment in time, if you were to diagnose the disease of planet Earth, it would be the autoimmune disease of Homo sapiens sapiens a species that's supposed to know itself from the verb sapere, which means to taste or to know, to a species that is aware and is aware that it's aware, not thought and meta-awareness, awareness, awareness uh, not thought and metacognition, but awareness and meta-awareness. So I um, really urge you to um, throw yourself into this conference like a love affair. Uh, whether you're wearing a mask or you're not, and whether you're concerned about the social distance, and I get it because I was just doing it myself early in the week, first time I've been out in two years. Uh, so 
And if you read the papers, like we don't know where we are in relationship to COVID. So there's all sorts of indicators that we need to be really, really, really present and attentive and not caught up in fear narratives or idiotic hope narratives either, but to, in some, science, some sense, find the a kind of appropriate way to continually diagnose at the micro level and at the global level, how we can contribute to tipping things in the direction of well-being and peace and out from all the othering and the hatred and the greed and the delusion that's driving uh, incredible levels of violence that manifest as, you know, global warming and murder on a colossal scale at a time when, you know, that was thought that we're, as humanity, supposed to be inching away from that. So uh, for the remaining time that we have, I really want to invite a dialogue, uh, which is a kind of very active meditative form of inquiry. So when someone cares to pose a, a question, let's all respond to that question inwardly ourselves and I'll do my best to, in some sense, uh, explore it with whoever is asking. We don't have that much time, but uh, this is the kind of thing that I hope will go on in a certain kind of inquiry for you, all of you who are part of this Wisdom 2.0 conference throughout the entire conference and then only for the rest of your life, say. <laughs> so let's get started. Hi, John. It's Annie Gallagher. I'm here on stage. I'm going to help with this Q&A. We have a microphone. Wonderful. Hi, John. We have a, a microphone over here. If anybody would like to go on over, introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, and it'd be nice if I can see the person. Yeah, yeah. so come on up and come so on I can up. see you. You have a spotlight on you. Don't be shy. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Hi. Is this good? Yes. Could you introduce yourself? Let us know where you're from. And, yes. and there's John. Hey, John. Uh, my name's Corey Mascara. I uh, just moved to Palo Alto a couple years ago. Grew up in New York, though. Um, I sat with you about 10 years ago when I was 22 in Mount Madonna, uh, you and Saki, and it... Um, it really inspired a 10-year teaching journey. And so I have a deep bow of gratitude for you, and thank you. Um, one of the things I've noticed as my journey has gone from secular mindfulness to Theravada to trying to fill in all these gaps where I felt maybe certain practice didn't answer everything that I was inquiring into was that a lot of beliefs have changed, new things I've become attuned to, and new um, expansions internally. And so I'm curious as you consider your own practice and journey, if there's anything at this point that you're more attuned to, that you're questioning or you're believing that is different from let's say 10 years ago or 20 years ago. The short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but the love affair that meditation really is when we take our seat or when we live with mindfulness in the way I was describing. Um, it's always a kind of uh, growing us. So we're learning, growing, healing, transforming. So it's not like uh, we stop learning or we stop growing. Uh, but in terms of the fundamental love affair with wakefulness uh, and with the potential for embodied wisdom and well-being at the level of the individual and then at the level of the body politic. No, I can't say that it's changed in not just 10 years, but in 50 or 60 years. And the reason I'm saying that is in some sense because I hope that uh, it lands in people's ears or hearts in such a way that authenticates and valid validates the very fact that, you know, the Buddhists would say like it's your your true nature or your Buddha nature. The fact is there's no improving on you, no matter how old you are. <laughs> the real challenge is whether you can actually inhabit the full dimensionality of who you already are. And my little pointing out the personal pronouns and how kind of uh, sticky they can be uh, and problematic was, was really meant to give us all permission 
to not believe our narratives, no matter how wonderful they are, about how much we've changed in 10 years or whatever. I mean, if you ask my family members, they probably say, well, he hasn't changed at all. <laughs> you know? Uh, and the fact is that there's an element of paradox in that, just as there is in Chan or Zen. It's like, yes and no. Change and same old, same old. But <laughs> what... And that means that awareness can hold all of that so that you don't necessarily get caught by your old habits of same old, same old in the way that you might have 10 years ago or 50 years ago. I hope that's of some use. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, John. A lot of gratitude. Thanks. Nice to see you again. Yes. Thank you. All right, we'll have our next question. Hi, Dr. kabat My name's Kimiko Bokura. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel very nervous right now. This is my first time in the last two years to be in a public situation. While I've been conducting uh, conferences and uh, trainings over the, over the uh, internet and uh, Zoom. Yeah. And uh, so, so I, felt, I thought I'm getting used to like, connecting with people, but now I'm feeling like it, it feels very new and nervous and make me very nervous at the same time. <clears throat> And my well, question... let, me, let, me, let me give you a hug, okay? Oh, <laughs> okay. I know. <laughs> Thank you. She needs a hug. So my question is, not only the Zoom um, space, now it's a metaverse and uh, mm. VR is coming into the scene. And uh, uh, I wonder, uh, uh, the, I, I am wondering what's your thought on this emergence. For example, I have a friend who is a Zen monk in Japan, and he uses VR to consult uh, for the uh, suicide prevention. And he's not de he's not fa uh, he's not face to face with the client. He's dealing with this uh, kind of uh, made up identity. But for those people somehow it works and he's utilizing it. Yeah. But at the same time, it's highly, highly, even more sensory engaging than the Zoom and everything. So there is a lot of uh, concern about uh, dopamine uh, uh, trigger. So I'm just wondering what your thought about that. Wow, what a, what a wonderful question. Uh, and um, really um, poignant that you bring up the dopamine triggers because of course, <laughs> Uh, our technology is increasingly uh, addictive in certain ways. Uh, and so, you know, even email, can't live with it, can't live without it. Phones, you know, you know, it's like supercomputer in your pocket, complete interconnectivity, except maybe with yourself, because you're like perpetually distracted. And they say that we check our phones like every few minutes, you know, over 300 times a day. Uh, well, why do we need to do that? What are we missing? So uh, I've had uh, some experience with VR and with uh, uh, various very sophisticated programs that could allow you to uh, do martial arts or dance on the surface of Mars or on the surface of Moon or in any kind of constructed reality. And of course, there's no stopping this, just the same way as this, there was no stopping audio cassette tapes, which is where I first developed my guided meditations. And they were very <laughs> useful to actually uh, recruit the technology for the sake of healing. So perhaps that technology can be used, but it's going to not be any better than the minds that develop the applications to it, okay? And so if you're using avatars, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for, you know, sort of encountering people when you yourself are socially isolated or anything, maybe because you're paralyzed or whatever, constrained in many ways. It has the potential to be a healing, but uh, as with all of the technology, it's a double-edged sword. And I think the more uh, the Silicon Valley engineers and uh, all of the people involved in Silicon Valley, <coughs> excuse me, um, are aware of the shadow side of this. The more we can actually um, use whatever technologies are, uh, that, that become available as a way to ground ourselves and not give up on, but, but in some sense learn to inhabit our analog the beauty of our analog being, which 
don't forget, virtual reality may have a, you know, sort of a life uh, span so far of maybe 30 years or 20 years or whatever. Thank you. <coughs> Thank but you. Uh, we're the product of uh, billions of years of evolution. And there's a certain wisdom baked into the universe of uh, our atoms and molecules and cells that's really extraordinary. And it's time we wake up to it before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for your hug. It's, and maybe she needs a real hug at some point, so reach out if you do, please. <laughs> John, we only have about three and a half minutes left, so we have one, there we go. She got her hug. <laughs> one more Good. question. Time for one more quick question. Right. Thank wow. you. Um, well, hi, John. I'm Caitlin Krauss. Hi, Annie. Hi. And this yes. question, it couldn't have been more perfect because I do XR experience yes. design. I'm a designer yes. of virtual reality, <laughs> yes. and I teach digital well-being at Stanford. And I, I started a program about 10 years ago called MindWise, to empower meaningful human connection. So it's yeah. not about, like what you just said, I would echo back, it's human first, it's not binary, I do believe in well-being in the metaverse, and it's been amazing just doing these experiences and these designs that bring people into a state of wonder and awe. So right now I'm tracking wonder and awe, you know, collaborating with people like Dr. Keltner. But I came up here just to ask you, because I carry with me a lot of um, presence and a lot of your words. So I go back to that statement, wherever you go, there you are. Mm -hmm. And I know right now there's a, an epidemic of what people are calling FODA, like there's a fear of doing anything. You know, a fear of in different generations, a fear of dating, a fear of going outside your comfort zone. Yeah. So um, my question is kind of beyond and with technology, if anything's changed in your mind with that quote, wherever you go, there you are, you know, um, about how we connect and how we encourage ourselves to keep taking risks that feel good, you know, to keep checking in. I didn't know if maybe there were uh, some new phases in your life in the past two years that shed light on that, that human ability to kind of be buoyant and be joyful in the midst of suffering. Uh, what comes to mind immediately is uh, William Butler Yeats's lines, we must laugh and we must sing, we are blessed in everything. And don't forget the word blessed or blessing it, it also means wound in French. It comes from the root mm. meaning to wound. So we are blessed in everything. There's always a wound associated with it in kind of Jungian sort of tradition. Uh, everything we look upon is blessed. Not just everything we look upon, but everything we, we extend in our doing. So you're developing a, a, a VR, you know, sort of a, a, a yeah. algorithms or whatever it is. They're coextensive with your heart. So the more you are in alignment with what you love, the more the VR will actually be an expression of that. And then you can also, because of your wisdom and discernment, capacity, core intelligences, build in safeguards so that it can't be uh, abused in certain kinds of ways or misused to create more harm than good. So this is a kind of like Zen koan for all of us on the planet uh, because we're all capable of both doing harm and of <clears throat> you know, loving. And so uh, if we just project all the harm onto other people, the bad people, the bad guys, and uh, we're the good guys. Well, that's the, the core delusion of us and them, uh, which doesn't recognize our humanity at all and the we rather than the me. John, so, John and Caitlin, uh, sorry, we to have stop. to wrap up. <laughs> we really could we go on forever. We literally, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so we literally much. could go on forever. Thank you. Let's keep this going, the conversation live online, everywhere we can find it. Thank you. Everybody, John. John Cabot's in, the man. Sorry, we'll get back Hi, to folks. questions another time. Have a wonderful we gotta go. Conference. We gotta roll. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you.